monocultural industrial agriculture. This is sugarcane and nothing but sugarcane as far as the eye can see. No interactions, no diversity. Nothing that harmonizes with a natural system. This doesn't occur in nature. Let's have a look at the soil here and see what it actually looks like. Ugh. Although this is actually a planned field, I can hardly break up the soil. We've just got incredibly hard, compacted, dead soil. How did we end up like this? How did we end up supplying the food and the needs of humanity through totally unnatural processes? through simplistic systems. A famous chemist in history, von Liebig, in the 1800s, discovered how he could manufacture sulfuric acid and then break down rocks, basic elements, and make a salt-based fertilizer, just using NPK. That is all a plant needs to grow. That is our basic fertilizer. But for a plant to be really healthy, we need the additions of other elements to build its body. And that's where we've gone wrong and we have no favouring of the soil through the salt-based fertilisers. They do not favour the soil life. So once we started this industrial fertiliser process, the soil fertility was continuously declining. And the costs are continuously rising, and they continue to rise in industrial agriculture, where with our organic, and designed ecosystemic systems, our costs are dropping all the time and the quality of our product is rising and so is the quality of our soil. And that's what this video is all about. And we're gonna take you through all the steps of composting, organic matter return, interactions with animals, plants, trees, and wildlife with the lessons of how to do it so you can feel more secure about your future food security and health. Hi, I'm Jeff Lawton and this is Zaytuna Farm. I'm on roughly an acre of ground here. And you can see the animals grazing in the background. And there's quite a few animals there and we have a few more horses and sheep and, and larger animals. We have chickens and poultry on the farm. And it looks like quite a lot of biomass. But the real biomass is in the topsoil. Here's a teaspoon of soil here. And in this teaspoon, there's a billion bacteria, a million fungi, 10,000 amoebas. There's little protozoas and nematodes. The weight of biomass is actually this soil life. There can be easily 40 tons of life in an acre of topsoil. Can be up to 200 tons of life in an acre of topsoil. What we have done with the soil life is we've destroyed it by digging and ploughing and turning the soil over. Now that does create fertility. If you start off with an ecosystem and you cut it down, 
You take away the product or you burn it, whatever you do with the living elements that are above the soil. And then you plow the soil and you turn that soil over, you destroy the soil life. And their dead bodies is the fertility that's released to the crops. So you're running on the dead organisms. Now, there's a timeline for that. It's a finite resource. If you're not farming in a harmonious way, if you're not gardening in a harmonious way, where you're putting back as much as you're taking out, it is going to end sooner or later. The real life, the real partnership we have to understand for sustainable design is partnering with the life in the soil. There is a really exciting web of life in the soil. It's an enormous diversity of organisms that can't photosynthesize, so they have to link to plants. And the ability for plants to capture carbon through photosynthesis and create exudates off their roots, which the organisms live from and exchange to with minerals. So the fungi, the bacteria, the protozoa, the nematodes, they go on out to larger organisms like worms and insects, right up to the large mammals, all interacting with that carbon exchange. It's an enormous diversity, and it's the diversity that gives it the quality and builds the quantity of beneficial, high-quality soil. So it's a very, very exciting and not much understood world of organisms all in continuous symbiotic relationships, benefiting each other, extending all sorts of elements and minerals out through soil interdependency. It's a living system. Soil is alive. And that's what we have to work with. That's the important thing. That's where we have to link back to to get a fertile, productive world. Here we are on the forest floor. And this is where the leaves end up. Deciduous leaves falling onto the ground and decomposing down to become the humus, the water holding material. Here, the soil microbes and all kinds of little organisms start to break these materials down. The lignum fiber in the leaf, the cellulose in the leaf all gradually decompose to become this extremely special material, humus. The material that gives us incredible stability in the topsoil and our ability to hold on to the fertilizer and give us the growth that we need to sustain everything we need to produce. Now, in recent years, the industrialization of processes towards productivity from the soil has destroyed the quality and very much the quantity of soil available to us. We have to reverse that and to do it quickly, we have to build the diversity. We have to increase the numbers of organisms with the number of diversity that's available. They are not always present. So to inoculate the soil is to bring in elements of life. Of those 50 million genus of bacteria, 50 million genus of fungi that are potentially 
available to us through capturing organisms in compost processes by taking a very diverse mixture of compostable materials to make a compost as a humus that contains special organisms that are not presently available in our industrially destroyed and degraded soils. So your inoculum are the special elements that are missing from soils that have been badly degraded. And that increases our potential in both quality, speed, and quantity of soil production. Compost. We're gonna take you through the process of making a simple compost that anybody can make almost anywhere. It's just a recipe of ingredients. Now, we've got different manures here that we've gathered from animals around the farm. We've got different carbon materials, as in some dried grass clippings. We've got some green grass clippings. We've got some woody mulch. And I'm gonna show you the materials and then we're gonna put it together. And as I do, I'm gonna to explain to you the basic rules of the recipe so that you can always get it right and it'll always work for you and what the intention is at the end, what it is you end up with as a product. Let's have a look at some of our materials here. Here we have some goat manure. Here we have some cow manure. Here we have some duck manure from the duck tank. All of these manures will work for you. Here we have some chicken manure mixed in with straw. Over here we even have some old pig manure. Right? It doesn't really matter which manure, but if you use a mixture of manures, you'll get a different set of mineral components. Now, that's the, that's the fire, that's the nitrogen component, mostly. And here we have some dry grass clippings that have just come off the fields and the paddocks. It's just been slashed with a tractor and raked up. It's not too long, it's reasonably short. You don't want it really, really long. It'll make it hard to turn over. Here, we have another component. This is sawdust mixed with compost toilet manure. So this is human manure mixed in. This is human manure that's come out of a compost toilet after it's been sitting for about three to four months. So it's well processed. It's no longer got any pathogens in it. Over on this side, we have some green grass clippings. This is green material. And on this green material, you'll find there's, if we had to look at this in the microscope, there'd be quite a few soil organisms and they're kind of captured on here. This is like capturing a yeast. The organisms come with the green material. So we're kind of inoculating with this. We come over this way, we have some wood mulch. These are shredded up hardwood and softwood trees and weed trees. It's been through a shredder. There's actually a worm there. Compost worm already there. These, this, this is the fungal food. The, f the fungus likes to break down the wood. Fungus will break down the lignum fiber. So this is good fungal food. The manures are good nitrogen food. And the green, green material have a lot of organisms captured, particularly things like protozoas. Over this way, this is what we're gonna end up with. We're gonna end up with a compost. This is quite a woody compost, got quite a lot of woody material. It's probably quite high in fungus. Good material for fertilizing trees because it'll have good fungal dominated life in it. Trees need fungus, a forest grows on a fallen forest, 
So you have to make a, a compost that has a lot of fungal organisms because fungal dominated soils are much better for growing woody trees. Here are the fungal threads, the hyphae, that, that travel long distances through the soil and break down the lignum fiber of the wood. The fungal threads in the soil, the hyphae, travel for kilometers down and kilometers away from the tree. They come to the trees for the photosynthetic interaction. There they harvest the carbon. They can't photosynthesize, but they can capture elements out at great distance with acid tips that bring back phosphates and other minerals and exchange them with the roots at the root level with the trees in the forest. This is an important situation because there's an actual communication between the stress reaction of the tree transferred through the fungal threads to other trees. This is the internet of the soil. The fungi spores are very easily damaged by inappropriate land use. Um, if, we, if, if there's too much compaction, too much disturbance, too much ploughing, too much chemicals, too much overuse, you'll actually get to a stage where you may have to bring in fungal spores in well inoculated compost so that you can reintroduce the diversity for a quick recovery. Plants that are herbaceous, non-woody, you're more likely to need a bacterial dominated compost because the pastures and the vegetable gardens, they favor a nitrogen rich soil. So a bacterially dominated soil is higher in nitrogen and it grows those faster cycles of non-woody plants. I'm gonna take the uh, carbon material and we're just gonna make a nice fluffy bottom to this because we want the compost to be aerated at the bottom. We want a nice loose, you can use small sticks if you've got them. Now we're going to have to make one cubic metre minimum. That's a thousand litres. If you try and make a compost any smaller than that, it just won't get hot enough. You have to make sure that it's got the right size, otherwise it won't get up to the right temperature. It's like not having a hot enough oven to cook the cake. Bit of cow manure. Now, the aim is to have 25 parts carbon and one part nitrogen. Then the decomposition happens without reducing the size of the material. So we try and mix this up with the right proportion so that it gets hot enough, but it doesn't actually lose any volume. The trick of making good compost is to not lose size. You're gonna end up with a cubic meter the same as what you started. That's something a lot of people don't believe is possible, but it is possible. We've done it many times, and it's a good indicator that you've got the right mix. If you have too much nitrogen, it'll break down too quickly and it will start to lose size. It will get very hot, but you'll waste a lot of material because the volume will decrease rapidly and it will be very smelly as it decomposes. You'll, have, you'll produce a lot of methane. If you've got the right size and you've got the right proportions of carbon to nitrogen ratio, and this is part of the carbon I'm putting on now. What will happen is it won't smell very much, it will get up the temperature, but it won't decrease in size very much at all. Now the temperature we're going to have to aim for 
is a minimum of 50 degrees centigrade. If it doesn't get to 50 degrees centigrade, it won't have broken down all the weed seeds and it won't have anywhere near the same amount of life in it. Now the maximum temperature you could get to is 70 degrees centigrade and that's getting a little bit too hot. It's probably going to get anaerobic at that temperature. It's going to go a bit airless. And you've actually gone past the limit a little bit on life. We now realize, looking with a microscope, the best temperature is around 55 to 65. That's the, that's the range where there's most diversity of life and most volume of life. Just right here in the middle of the pile, wicked head. Some kind of inoculum. I'll cover it up quite quickly. Hmm. That's a, a bit of a remains of a, a dead animal processed on the farm. Um, you can use urine as an inoculum. You can use comfrey as an inoculum. You can use nettles and you could use yarrow. You could use fish or a, a dead animal that might even just be something you found as a roadkill on the side of the road. It will break down quite quickly in there and it'll speed up the decomposition. This is comfrey and it's one of the compost activators. You don't have to add an activator, but it can help get your initial heat up. So we're gonna construct it and then we're gonna leave it for four days. And in those four days, the organisms are gonna get their breed population started. Gonna to start to build up their numbers. And then after four days, we're gonna turn it again. And that'll mix a lot of things together and then it'll also kill a lot of organisms and their bodies are going to be consumed by the next generation of organisms. So this is a, a sort of thermonuclear life and death cycle. All these little organism colonies are going to burst into life and multiply rapidly and create a lot of heat. There's a lot of breeding going on. It's going to be a little bit cooler on the outside. When we turn it over, we're going to make the party turn inside out. What's a bit cool and passive on the outside is going to go to the inside and become hot and steamy and very active. The process then will start to take organism to organism, body to body. One colony becomes another colony as it's consumed the dead bodies of the previous party. And the carbon which life is based in is going to bond the nitrogen and all the other elements into a humus, a stable humus. Carbon is the sponge, nitrogen is the fuel, and any other elements that are involved then become additions to long chain carbon molecules. So the long chain carbon molecules stick the process together. They become the sponge. Nitrogen is the fuel, and everything else adds a little spice to the event. Even toxic substances, even if there's a little bit of toxicity here in some of these materials, that'll get locked up. That'll get locked up in the long chain carbon molecules and become inert. This is one of the great things about the natural system. 
It really is ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And these cycles bond up the toxicity so it's not a problem anymore. That's how the environment neutralizes the effects of toxins. And we're just putting these, the, the most diverse environment of life in the known universe, the soil organisms. We're putting them to work for us. We couldn't have more workers. And that becomes very obvious when you look in the microscope. We could even add a bit of charcoal at this stage. Charcoal has an enormous surface area and it creates a habitat for the organisms. So what you've really got is a high density housing commission for soil bacteria. But charcoal, with its enormous surface area, a tablespoon of dissolved charcoal can have a surface area of up to 10 acres. That gives an attachment for the organisms to take up residence and hold the fertility in the life form so it can't be leached. It's not the soil itself, it's the soil life that's the most important element. We really need a little bit of chunky material at the end so they 